Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Will he want to go back? This is Kurt Angle, and welcome to the Kurt Angle Show. On the show today, we're going to have another special guest as the stars always come out on the Angle Pod. But first, let me introduce to you my co-host, Paul Bromwell. How you doing today, Paul? Kurt, you're not lying, my friend. I'm doing great. Think about the guests we've had so far this year. Miro, Mickey James, Chris Jericho, and this week we've got a current world champion, man. That's right. Ring of Honor world champion, Jonathan Gresham. Welcome to the show, Jonathan. Thank you guys for having me. Hey, Sorry. listen, listen, man, we, we, uh, Kurt and I have been talking about this. We've been looking forward to this one and, uh, I'm sure the topic on everyone's mind is going to be the current status of you and ring of honor and AEW and all that good stuff. We're going to get there. I promise. But first let's start where it all started for you. How and when did you get started in the wrestling business? Uh, it was 2005. Um, uh, I was here in Atlanta, Georgia. I ran into um, uh, a guy that ran a dealership named um, Rocky King. Not sure if you guys are familiar. That's right. Um, NWA. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I ran into him. Uh, my mom introduced us because she knew I was really big into wrestling. Um, so a little bit before 2005, uh, I was talking to Rocky. He introduced me to a, a gentleman um, named Frank Aldrich that owned a professional wrestling school. Evidently, it used to be the power plant, the WCW power plant. But then after everything shut down, um, you know, what was left over was called WWE 4. And so um, that's the school I joined. And uh, the main trainer there was uh, Big Cat Mr. Hughes or Total Protection Mr. Hughes. Yeah. Well, Jonathan, early in your career, who were your favorites to watch? Oh, man. Um, uh, the person that got me into wrestling was Bam Bam Bigelow. I'm not really – I can't really explain that one uh, based on my <laughs> that's style. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, um, that's what kind of like, uh, attracted me to pro wrestling was, uh, Batman Bigelow. And then from there I've like matured. And of course, um, you know, the Mysterios, of course, cause he was closer to my size. Um, of course, Kurt Angle, uh, you know, um, uh, Guerrero, Malenko, all the, uh, more technical guys were, uh, more my taste of wrestling. So I was really into those guys. Um, then I started to bleed into like, um, wrestling from other countries. So, um, you know, uh, an individual named Kuto Yadaka from Zero One, uh, Shinjiro Otani from, of course, Zero One New Japan. All these guys kind of became my favorites. So the list really goes on. I could be here all day with that one. <laughs> John, I got to ask you, do you have a favorite Bam Bam Bigelow match of all time since she was your uh, favorite? I do not. Um, I was just, uh, you know, tuning in for him at first because that was my introduction. And at the time, I really wasn't, I wasn't following matches. I wasn't like uh, smart to wrestling at the time. I got so, you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, listen, was there a style of wrestling that you were more interested in than others? 
Um, that came later uh, when I got a little bit more mature and smarter in wrestling. Um, but uh, the super junior style, like the quicker, fast paced, more technical style, really like took my eye. Um, and then in time, I learned to appreciate like heavy psychology, like heavyweight bouts. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I would probably say the world of sports style has taken more so of my attention in the last like decade or so. Well, Jonathan, what was it like trying to get exposure back when you first started? Uh, it was, for me, it was very difficult. Um, of course, again, I'm, I'm one of the wrestlers that are on the smaller uh, scale, soft side of the scale. So uh, I stand about 5'4 when I started. Uh, I was amateur wrestling around um, 103 to 119 weight class. So that guy, gives huh? you, <laughs> yeah. So that gives you an idea of like where I started. Um, <clears throat> so starting out, it was very difficult for me to like break through. I remember um, I was wrestling for a company right after uh, Deep South dissolved. Uh, a lot of the guys started coming to this uh, one company that I was working with regularly in Alabama called uh, GCW. So um, I was already there when these guys started filtering in. Uh, we could see our, our, a lot of the independent guys getting squeezed out, uh, but they kept me around. So I ended up going to the promoter and asking him um, how it worked and how I could like build myself like towards the upper card so I could learn how to be like a mid card guy, a main event guy. Uh, and he quote said to me that uh, you're exactly where you're supposed to be opening up the show hot. So um, that's when it dawned on me that I couldn't stay there. There had to be somebody that, you know, saw wrestling the way that I saw it, that, uh, you know, different body frames, uh, different styles uh, make fights. So um, I just left the Georgia, Alabama scene and started traveling and I ended up finding myself wrestling for Booker T's, uh, promotion out in Houston. And then uh, around 2008, I got my first uh, international booking, which I ended up living in France for about two years after that. So, hmm. um, yeah, so it kind of just started slow and speedballed into that. Would you consider uh, Shikara uh, your your first big break? No, uh, Shikara was um, IWA Mid-South, actually. So okay. um, <clears throat> uh, around 2008, around the same time that I got the opportunity to with Booker's place, uh, Ian Rodden from my Bay Mid South held a tryout. Uh, myself and a couple of uh, the local guys from my school went there. I think it was like a twenty dollar entry fee, so we did that. Um, and uh, I was one of the guys that was brought back. And uh, because of that, I got an opportunity to uh, wrestle with uh, Seth Rollins. I think uh, like a three match series, um, Jimmy Jacobs and uh, Cole Cabana. Uh, and it's really interesting because in uh, and about two years, three years after that, those relationships that I had built off of those matches um, kind of helped me, uh, you know, get my foot in the door at Ring of Honor around 2011, I believe. So uh, that was actually my, my like, coming out party, I guess, is wrestling for IWA Mid-South. Well, you mentioned Booker T a couple of times. You worked for his company off and on. What were you able to learn from Booker? Hmm. Um, He's a great teacher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And more so, it wasn't in ring stuff. It was basically um, coming from the independence. You really uh, have the sense of like, well, at least me anyway. Everything in wrestling is given. Uh, a lot of people like to say you earned it or whatever, but in reality, um, the bookers and different people like that pretty much give you everything you have. You can work hard for it, but at the end of the day, um, you know, everything is given to you. So something that Booker um did was uh he was the first company that flew me out and um he kind of taught me at an early age in wrestling that like you have to ask for what you want um it was always waiting Speak to up per se yeah 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 exactly so um you know uh i think the first trip i had for him i, I was on greyhound uh from atlanta to houston was 24 hours on a Greyhound. <laughs> yeah. And uh, unfortunately for me, I was seated right next to the bathroom. And the, there was a revolving door, of course. And also the, the door was broken, so it kept swinging open. So I was positioned in the, um, in the back of the Greyhound with my foot <laughs> wedged up against the door to keep it closed uh, for most of the trip. Um, so on the next trip that he invited me back, I kind of like explained it to him. And he kind of broke it down and told me, you know, if these are the things you want, you got to speak up. And I really appreciate him having that conversation with me because that kind of um, helped me later on in my career just to kind of come out of my, my shell because I was uh, a very um, shy individual, I guess, coming up. Better communication, right? 
Yes, sir. Yep. Man, that, that's awesome. And, and what a mentor in Booker T. I mean, you really couldn't ask for anybody better who experienced, I'm sure, lots of different things going through the business at the time period that he did. So, man, sure. super cool for you to, to, to really get to, to be under him. You won, you've won championships all over the world. You were CZW champion, independent champion, a tag champion in WXW in Germany. Who was the first company that you really uh, feel put themselves behind you? It would have to be zero one in Japan. Um, so at the time I was already living in France, like I mentioned earlier, um, cliff notes here. Uh, I was staying at like this hostel um, with a couple of other wrestlers. And um, this guy, he ended up wrestling for the cruiserweight classic named Ho Ho Lan. Uh, he's from uh, China. He runs a company in Hong Kong and uh, we trained together uh, periodically when he came through. And uh, one day he offered me a booking and he was like, would you like to come to Hong Kong? And I was like, of course. And so he hooked up uh, uh, it's like training and stuff where I would like help teach guys in Taiwan and stuff. So I went over and during the show in Hong Kong, um, the booker of Zero One Japan was there. And uh, the Japanese company was in the middle of uh, their fire festival, fire festival tour, which is like their heavyweight tournament. Um, so I had to match with this young man named Jason New, who now works for Dragon Gate. He also did the Cruiserweight Classic for uh, WWE. But um, we had our match, and after the match, uh, Mr. Nakamura came to me and asked me, uh, could I come to Japan? And so um, he ended up flying me from Hong Kong to Japan. That was my first tour with them. Uh, after that, I uh, spent about a week, maybe two weeks with them at the time. And then um, he asked me if I wanted to come back. And, um, of course, I said yes, so I ended up coming back. And that's when I was actually able to um, train under and get a chance to wrestle one of my favorite wrestlers, which is Kucho Idaka from uh, the Zero One promotion. So that was a real treat for me. And um, that year, I think it was 2012, they pushed me into their junior heavyweight tournament final to where I actually got a chance to wrestle with uh, Hidaka and I was able to uh, be put forward to win the tournament. So at the time, they had given me like four junior titles at one time. Oh. So that was like the company that gave me my first big push. Um, and got behind me really well. Um, but I botched it, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> In what way? Talk about that. You botched it. Uh, so um, at the time, Zero One, uh, they weren't really doing well business-wise um, in 2012. So business was down. They were doing Cork and Hall, but they were like not selling out. Um, so that was pretty much the biggest hall we would do. And then we would do like uh, Shankiba First Ring or stuff like that, which is like a smaller, more intimate hall, like 200 people. So um uh, I would come over and they would bring me over for like two weeks, but I would get to do like two main shows at Corgan Hall and then maybe like a dojo show or something. So the other guys that were coming in were able to do other companies like Noah and Big Japan. And so me not being smartened up to how business works in Japan, uh, I went to the office after like thinking it over a little bit to myself. Uh, and I, I go to the office and ask them if I can work for other companies while I'm over. And evidently this wasn't the way to do it because as I was asking the question to like the main booker who is not Nakamura, Nakamura was on the other side of the room on his computer doing his work as he always does. And I asked the question. And when I asked the question, Oki-san, the guy that is the booker, he makes like this really surprised sound and he looks at me and then Nakamura from behind his computer. I remember looking up at him. He looks from beyond his computer like this and he goes, and then starts working again. The <laughs> next trip that I got, I just slowly started losing all of the junior oh, titles. No. And then, oh, yeah, man. I just didn't get brought back. Um, so that was how I, I, I botched that one. And later on, I learned that um, it's pretty much once they bring you over for like a visa, uh, you are exclusively theirs, I guess, in their minds. So um, trying to work other places would have to be negotiated between the company asking for you, not me asking to work for the company. So, yeah. Well, moving forward, Jonathan, it took you a few years to really get going in ring of honor. Was that a company you were always hoping to join? Yeah. Um, they changed the way that I thought the presentation, the, the style of the wrestlers. I, um, I always watched WWE impact and uh, WCW when I was coming up. Um, but I never looked at those places and told myself that, I'm going to wrestle there. Uh, I can get there. I, I just enjoyed it. I know I wanted to be a wrestler. When I found out about the independence and wrestling overseas, um, pretty much that was my goal to wrestle overseas. When I found Ring of Honor um, around 2004, that's when it hit me. And I told myself that's where I wanted to go. 
So everything from training to going to all these different countries are all in preparation for me joining Ring of Honor. So, um, yeah, that was the place I always wanted to go. Um, and in the back of my mind, I, I didn't tell anybody or say it out loud, but I always like dreamed of it and had it in my mind that I wanted to be Ring of Honor World Champion. So um, I just kept working towards that quietly and patiently working towards that. Well, Jonathan, you certainly did a lot in Ring of Honor in such a short time from forming Search and Destroy with Jay White, Chris Saban, and Alex Shelley, to teaming with Jay Lethal in 2019 to beat the Briscoes for the world tag titles. Before COVID, what stands out in your mind as something our listeners should go out of their way to check out with you in Ring of Honor? Hmm. I guess the first match I had with uh, with Lethal, um, that match is pretty special to me uh, because it was like, uh, it wasn't in the cards for me to tag with Lethal or to even have that match. Uh, really quickly, I, I was approached by Lethal after a, a match I had, and he said to me, hey, I, I want to work with you. And I, I was like really low on the card, opening match, sometimes dark match. And uh, I was thinking to myself, well, yeah, that's that's going to happen. This guy is like world champion and all this stuff. And so um, he leaves. We don't really have a discussion about it anymore. And then one day uh, we're in the locker room. He goes, hey, I think we're going to wrestle each other soon. And then I get word that we are, and it was taking place in North Carolina. I think it was Concord, North Carolina. And um, after that match, uh, it, it, it flipped the switch in the minds of the, the bookers and the people in the office to where they actually started investing in me, time, matches, um, you know, uh, promos and things of that nature. And so if it wasn't for Lethal, uh, I probably wouldn't be in the position I am today. So uh, that match is like the start of everything for me in Ring of Honor. So um, – I think that's one that I really look back on uh, fond of, and I would ask people to probably watch that one. Right. Cool. When the world stopped for COVID, did you think that was it for you as a wrestler? <sighs> yes. Yes, I did. I try to stay optimistic. I'm a pessimist, um, you know, from the start, but uh, when it hit, um, I was financially in a pretty good situation, um, but I was more concerned about my, uh, my comrades, guys that were like coming up and on paper appearance uh, for Ring of Honor. So I was really much thinking about them. Our race did a really good job of uh, keeping us on payroll the entire pandemic. So um, I was concerned, but I was also thinking, okay, I'm going to jump to what next? I had spent my entire adult life becoming a professional wrestler. So there was really nothing else I could really use that knowledge for. So that was kind of scary. But to answer the question, yeah, I thought it was over for me, but I was just going to just going to ride uh, the wave of the contract money still coming in and hope, hope for the best. Dude, such a, had to be such a scary time for so many, not just wrestlers, but just people in general. We were, you know, yeah. trying to figure out how to navigate that, but you specifically as a wrestler were, need that audience. You need the paying customers to come in so that they can see and be a part of it. How did you end up spending your time during the pandemic, Jonathan, uh, while you were on hiatus? It was very up and down for me. Um, in the beginning, it was really cool. I was like, I don't have to do anything. So, um, you know, I kept my schedule as normal. My wife and I, like, we bought up a whole bunch of equipment. Uh, we still have a lot of it now. We have, like, a home gym now in our garage. But we started when we lived back in Baltimore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, we started um, back when we lived in Baltimore. We bought, like, just a couple of free weights and things of that nature. And we would uh, do parking lot workouts. So uh, that was our big thing during the pandemic. And then, of course, after time, it was just like, what are we working out for? Like, there's no wrestling happening. Right. So then I started to sit around and eat. And then that turned into me binge watching all the shows on Netflix, all the Getting shows. Getting lazy, right? <laughs> yeah, Any favorites? Any favorites that you uh, remember? I, I don't remember. That was a really dark time for me. Everything kind of like um, kind of like flows together and then it gets fused together during that time. I do remember I ended up like binging video games so i played i played and beat maybe four or five video games oh, there you during go. that time yeah so <laughs> i was doing everything and then I, I i i didn't notice it but my wife did after the working out phase and after the eating phase and netflix phase i entered this this evidently this week long like depression period where i was just in bed i didn't even notice it mm -hmm. so i ended up having to like go into counseling for a little bit for that and counseling during the pandemic was way different than normal oh, counseling imagine, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, then I got out of that funk and then, uh, ring of honor 
started having meetings with the talent saying, that, oh, we're coming back. And from the moment that I heard that to the moment of the shows, I didn't have enough time to get back in shape. So I was looking really pudgy going back into the, um, the tapings for the Ring of Honor um, uh, no fan shows. So um, that's kind of how it went for me. It was very up and down, you know. If you're very ever, happy when Wilson came back. Though. Listen, Jonathan, if you're ever feeling like you need snacks, uh, Kurt has has <laughs> this brand called Chicken Snacks from Pure Chicken Protein. Snacks. I mean, it, they're amazing, man. All kinds of flavors, but we'll, we'll talk Jonathan, about that. Jonathan, I'll get your address afterward. I'll send you some. <laughs> there you go. All right. Thank I you. Love thank you. <laughs> hey, was it during your time off that started your thought process of forming Terminus? Okay, so uh, no, Terminus is um, something that my friend and I, uh, Baron Black, who works for AEW, um, we, we came up together uh, at WWE 4 uh, under Mr. Hughes, and uh, we would always do these independent shows with each other. And um, we would, leaving and going to the show, we would always talk about how the shows are promoted or like what we feel is wrong with the shows and stuff, um, how the shows are uh, like just executed um and we we thought we could add more to the shows um definitely more so here in atlanta because the scene kind of died after wcw went away um and there's shows on the outskirts of atlanta but there's nothing here in the city so uh baron and i talked for years um and uh you know present day we're financially in a much better place so we decided why not let's let's just try to do it um a lot of people think terminus is a um an answer to ring of honor going on hiatus but uh, it's not, it's just the timing was just perfect for that story to, to be like, um, uh, out there. But, um, that's pretty much what it was. Just my friend and I wanting to do it for a long time and, uh, help wrestling, uh, come back in the Atlanta area. Ah, well, so cool. So listen, we're, we're now back ring of honor returns. You're entered into the pure title tournament to reactivate the belt that wasn't used for a long time. How important was the pure title to you, Jonathan? It was super important to me because um, when I came into Ring of Honor, I did everything to get to Ring of Honor, uh, you know, and I got my first deal in 2013, I think it was, 2017, sorry, 2017. And um, when I finally signed, uh, I, I was loosely paying attention to the product. I was so busy with my own stuff, traveling back and forth around the world and stuff. And when I finally got my deal and I wrestled a few shows, I looked around and I was like, wait a minute, this place isn't what i remember it being stylistically it had changed um it had become a little more corporate which is a good thing in so many ways but stylistically uh the promotion had changed when it was more centered around competition and, and grappling and things of that nature it had kind of become in my eyes uh kind of the same that everything else has kind of become so i asked myself how can i differentiate myself knowing that i wrestle this particular way and uh there's no place in America really that caters to that style of wrestling. And so I just kept having this conversation with myself until I, I realized that there is a large demographic of the ring of honor fan base that appreciates and, 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 and misses the pure wrestling division. So that idea pretty much became my character. It became my voice. It just became who I am within the ring of honor universe and who I am pretty much as a wrestler in, in general. Um, so I use that uh, that idea uh, and anybody that would listen from the promoter to the referee, I was talking about it for, for a long time. And um, the opportunity came when the pandemic hit, they needed to rebrand, they needed to come back with something new and fresh. And um, they finally decided that it would be the pure tournament. Um, fortunately and unfortunately, a, a lot of guys like Yuji Nagata and guys from all over the world were announced for the tournament before the pandemic hit um at the time i was uh champs with lethal the tag champs and um you know there was no way that they were going to put me over for the pure tournament and the title at the time but then the pandemic hit um and then because of it a lot of the talents they were going to use they could no longer use uh, and maybe I, i'm wrong but i'd like to feel that i was not in the cards to win it um and at that point after everybody was taken away the only person that made sense at that time was me. I'd been preaching it for years at that point. So um, I guess they just decided to go with me. And uh, the rest is kind of history after that. Was that your biggest career achievement at that point, winning the tournament? I think so. I think so. Sure. Um, there's one other one during the, um, the lethal one. 
uh, when Lethal asked to wrestle me, we wrestled in North Carolina. Because of that match in North Carolina, the office started to see something in me, and they gave me two more matches with Lethal. The third match ended up being um, probably the biggest match to that point of my career was uh, me versus Lethal in a 30-minute Ironman match, and it was in the main event of the um, – center stage show in my hometown here in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was able to challenge for the world title in front of my family and friends. So for me, that was like the biggest match uh, of my career. So then this one would be, you know, knowing that the tournament was being brought back a lot because of myself uh, preaching and asking for it. Um, yeah. I look at that as like being really big and like uh, super important for my career that I was actually able to happen. And the company was investing in an idea that I had preached about for so long. So yeah, I think so. Well, dude, you certainly did bring it back and, and make it successful once again. Let's talk about forming the foundation with Tracy Williams, Jay Lethal, and Rhett Titus. Was there a plan for this that didn't get fully executed? To be honest, uh, everything was kind of last second with that. It was something that I was trying to do for so long. Um, uh, so when the Pure Tournament was, was, was playing out and I was kind of falling into my foundation character, originally the foundation was just for me in my mind. Um, and, uh, at the time, uh, Marty scroll had taken over booking of ring of honor and, uh, he had come to me and we started talking a little bit and, um, he had mentioned to me, the foundation sounds more like a stable than just a name for myself. Mm -hmm. And so I was against it, but, you know, I saw an opportunity to do what lethal did for me and it helped guys come up so at the time I was getting a lot so I said why not so I tried to look for guys that I feel like had a career similar to mine guys that are I believe really good in ring performers um but just haven't had the opportunity to break out within the ring of honor universe so um I believe it was right at the finals of uh the pure tournament um I was about to do the promo and I went to to hunter and i told him the idea of having uh hot sauce and tracy williams with me and of course lethal was already there by default um as the group of the foundation and i don't know what it was it just made sense to him at the time he said yes and then we filmed the promo like five minutes later um and that was the start of it so it was no like thought through plan on like ring of honor <laughs> and it was off the cuff huh yeah yeah man and, and some of those some of those are like the best ideas uh, absolutely you know I mean? so yeah, I was really happy that I was able to uh, form that group with those guys because uh, they're really hard workers, man. Really good wrestlers as well. Do you think Ring of Honor was in deep trouble when you were performing in an empty arenas? Um, I, it didn't occur to me because everybody was kind of doing the same thing. I didn't think anybody was in big trouble, uh, the company at all. But it was always one of those... Uh, conversations that the boys would have when we would go to Baltimore, for example, to wrestle at the college arena. I forget what it's called. Um, but we would have, I don't know, an arena for, I might be wrong, maybe like 3000 people, 4,000 people. Big arena. Yeah. 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 It's a pretty big arena. And, and then we would draw maybe three, 400 people. And, you know, a lot of us had asked the same questions back and forth about, moving to smaller halls to, to the pack them out. And that was never something that, uh, that happened. So it was one of those things. I'm not a numbers guy. I'm just a wrestler. So I would voice my opinion in meetings and, uh, if they use it, they use it. They don't, they don't, but uh, it was always a question of how long can this continue? You know, and that would come. And then of course it would go away. Cause I'm just concerned about the entering product. So well, I, I got to ask, how much chaos was going on uh, in the company before Final Battle, especially with Bandito having to miss the show? It was crazy. Yeah. Um, so at the time of Final Battle, we had our, I think we had already known about the hiatus happening. I want to say we do. I, I, the, the time frame is mixed up, but um, I don't remember there being much uh you know, panic or anything is just, I learned about the bandito situation on my travel to Baltimore. Um, I think I got an Instagram message from bandito and all it was, was him speaking Spanish frantically. And then him saying, I'm sorry, amigo, understood nothing. 
<laughs> and so um, I was like, what is this about? So I tried to contact him back. He didn't get back with me. And then I contacted Dragon Lee, who was a good buddy of mine, speaks really good English. And uh, he told me, yeah, Bandito contracted COVID. And I was like, oh, man. Uh. So I contacted Hunter uh, Delirious, the booker, and he told me he had already known. So in my mind, I'm thinking, whoa, okay, well, this match isn't happening now. Um, then I think I speak to either Lethal or Hunter, and they tell me that he might be doing it. And I'm thinking, that's not going to happen. He just signed the AEW. Um, but for me, that was the only, like, you know, thing that was kind of, I was concerned about coming in the final battle was just like, who am I going to wrestle? Then it was confirmed that it was lethal. And then it was, it was okay after that. I was more so concerned about Bandito being okay, because I think it's his second or third time having COVID. So uh, I know he was having a lot of respiratory issues. So I was more so concerned about that, but, uh, but yeah, that was pretty much it for me. I'm pretty sure there's more. I just don't remember it. <laughs> Hey, getting to win the getting to win the Ring of Honor title at Final Battle over Jay Lethal just weeks after he signed with AEW, did it feel like all your work, hard work, had finally paid off? Yeah, it did. Um, again, winning the Ring of Honor World Title was something that I had in the back of my mind uh, for years of wanting to accomplish that. That's the one thing I, I wanted to do that felt attainable, um, you know. And the way that it happened. It's kind of bittersweet. Unfortunately, my buddy Bandito contracted COVID, but fortunately I was able to win the Ring of Honor world title that I fell in love with, the one that Joe held, the one that Danielson held, the one that Jamie Noble held, CM Punk, and so on and so on. I was actually able to hold the same title that those guys held. Their fingerprints are on that championship. So um, for me, it, it meant the world. It was everything was full circle. We got a chance to finish off the 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 match series that lethal and i had you know i think it was up to four or five matches at that point uh he's one of my best friends i was actually able to compete with him uh, in the final era of the ring of honor that we know um so yeah it all just came full circle i'm just unfortunate that bandito wasn't there to share the moment with the locker room all right jonathan we're going to ask for some details here when ring of honor announces another hiatus who within the company is communicating with you and the talent? Talk to us about what this looks like. How often are you being communicated to? What are you hearing? Do you feel like you were getting updates, uh, you know, on a timely basis? No, I remember the call. Um, I remember just the, the, nobody was in the room together, but I could feel the air being sucked out of the room because when every, we knew that something was coming, we didn't know what it was. But when it was said that we're going on hiatus and guys are going to lose their jobs, it was like a big gasp, and it felt like everybody's win was taken away. Um, so everything was kind of communicated uh, at that point and then got off the phone uh, or Zoom call. And um, I remember I had the – I was fortunate enough to be able to talk to – um, Greg and Hunter on a phone call together, maybe 10 minutes after everybody got off the phone call. Uh, not a lot of guys had that moment to like talk to upper management one-on-one -on -one to get clarifications on some things. Um, fortunately I was, um, after that, I, I was able to speak to Hunter from time to time. He was working, you know, night and day on, uh, you know, coming back from the hiatus and, uh, you know, coming back to Supercard and having something big. So I was able to communicate with him, not as often as I would like, but for the most part, he had me going around defending the title. Um, and I had to get everything approved through Hunter uh, because they're doing things, to, I guess, keep records of it and get footage of it or whatever. So I had to make sure everything was approved. So I was able to talk to him pretty regularly. And just for our fans who may be not as familiar with Ring of Honor, when you say Hunter, can you explain his, his full name and what he does? <laughs> <laughs> not the game hunter. <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> but uh but uh he's delirious delirious is the promoter of ring of honor okay. um, booker as well yeah, yeah so um yeah that's that's pretty much how that went it was uh pretty good back and forth i think if i needed to talk to them and it was super important i could get in touch put it that way and is he the one who led the zoom call when the air got sucked out of the room and then the announcement was no made? That would be, I think Joe Koff held it. He's um, COO. And okay. then um, then it was Greg 
I forget his last name. Greg Geeland, I believe. I might be mispronouncing that, but hmm. what a tough what a tough time for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very tough. Losing your job. Uh yeah. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. But uh I was fortunate enough um that uh uh God works in mysterious ways and uh, a couple of weeks before that I was actually um in contact with uh progress uh in the UK and uh, WXW in Germany and uh I've had a pretty good relationship with them WXW since 2010 and then progress since about 2014 to 15 and uh before I learned anything about the hiatus I had already worked out deals to start working with them going forward so when it hit and you know I heard about me losing my job as well as my comrades like I was more so thinking about my friends that don't have relationships with other big independent companies. Uh, you know, they came straight from the smaller indies and got an opportunity at ring of honor. And that's a lot of them signed exclusively. So they weren't building these independent relationships anymore. They were strictly ring of honor. For me, I, I always made sure regardless of what I signed that I was able to go back to the independence because I feel like having a connection with the independence is very important for a performer because you get a chance to wrestle these new innovative young guys coming up. They teach you stuff. And not just that, you're, you're keeping up with uh, the who's who of the bigger indies. You know what I mean? So you keeping those relationships, establishing new ones, uh, you know, just in case you never know. Like I lost my job. I was able to go right back to the indies and, and keep going. Thank God for that. Well, where were you when Tony Khan announces that he purchased Ring of Honor? <laughs> So again, Bandito is like my boy. He's like the news guy for me. So um, I was in Ireland. I just got back from that trip, actually. Um, I was in Ireland, Dublin, and uh, I was doing shows and training for some guys out there. And uh, I was actually in my bed sleep. And then Bandito always texts me or Instagram me or something like that. But this particular time, my phone started ringing. It says Bandito. And I'm like, hello, what's up? He's talking to me. He's like, did you hear? And I'm like, uh, no, what's going on? Because I, I stay off of social media as much as I can. It keeps my mind focused and clear. So um, I, I didn't, had no clue what was going on. And he told me that Tony Khan had bought Ring of Honor. So at that point, my mind just explodes, which is like, that's great. That means Ring of Honor will continue, um, you know, past Supercard. So that made me happy because it's just like a company that I was so in love with for all these years as soon as I become world champion, it just dissolves. And that really kind of broke my heart. So just to hear the company continuing and because the company is continuing, that means hopefully myself and a lot of my friends, my comrades and other wrestlers will have a place to go because I mean, there's only so many jobs that you can make a living off of in wrestling right now. So ring of honor still existing is an opportunity for guys to make a living. So I'm very grateful and happy for that. You said Ring of Honor is a company that I'm in love with. And you know what? I think the good news is Tony Khan, and as he talked about the history of Ring of Honor, you can tell it was a company that he has been in love with as a fan in the early days. He has a lot of product knowledge. He's watched it as a kid growing up. So you're not only have a new owner, but he was a fan of the company from day one all the way through. Is there anything that you're aware of in terms of what the future may hold for Ring of Honor? Are you involved in any conversations? Are you hearing some stuff? Unfortunately, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, I'm going to say fortunately because I like the way Tony Khan tries to do things and uh, he tries to keep everything close to his chest. I believe that that helps uh, the excitement of wrestling. You know what I mean? The when surprise. things are all, yeah, when things are in the dirt sheets, it's almost like you don't have to watch the show anymore. That's right. You know, uh, I remember watching WCW and WWE. And then when guys would jump from WCW to WWE, I had no clue about it because I wasn't a dirt sheet reader. And it was awesome. I was excited. And it made me feel like I had to watch the next show. But in this era of social media and everybody telling secrets, it just doesn't make television exciting because you already know what's going to happen. You know what the writers are writing. Why would you want to know that? That's like going to a movie. You already have the fucking script. Excuse me. You already oh, have you're the script. Good. Yeah, You know, and it's just like, why would you do that? So I really like the way Tony Khan operates or he tries to operate. I know things still slip out because of other people, but I really dig that. I really dig that. But no, I don't know anything. Um, I'm in the dark. I'm 
Ring of Honor world champion, and I know absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a good deal, my friend. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I'm really interested in your new project, Terminus Modern Age Grappling. Explain yes. the reasoning behind what you're doing. Um, well, the first reason is because I want um, like a high profile show back in Atlanta. That was the main goal of uh, my buddy, uh, Black Baron and I. But to further that, um, I'm really big on entering psychology. I believe, uh, and this is not me talking ill of any company or any individual, but I feel that professional wrestling at its core is storytelling. Mm -hmm. And like any other form of entertainment, you have to understand act one to kind of have a good grasp of act two and so on and so on. In today's current environment of wrestling, I feel like, and uh, lack of a better way to say it, wrestling has become fireworks. It's just a lot of... A uh, bunch of high spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that if it was a variety show. But I feel that so many young wrestlers want to wrestle a certain way, but they're afraid to because they don't see anybody else doing it. Mm. From WWE to Impact to AEW to New Japan, stylistically, if you pay attention, all the wrestlers are kind of wrestling the same way. Guys are afraid to wrestle differently because they don't see anybody on television doing it differently. Right. So, or if they are doing it differently, very few guys are doing it differently. So um, they all do this high impact style because they feel like if I do this style, regardless of their body size and their ability to actually do it, they're trying to do it because they feel like that's what's going to bring them back to the show. Right. But in my mind, uh, to have heels and faces, you have to have rules implemented that heels can break that creates the heel persona and, and, and the reaction of the yay and boo. Um, a lot of guys, at least independently and in coming into a show like AEW impact nine times out of 10, you're not going to get the microphone if they are not investing in you really big. So it's difficult to let people know that you're a heel if you don't get a chance to talk. Sure. So on the indies, Normally you get booked, you don't get a chance to get a microphone or do anything. So that means you have to tell people your story from bell to bell. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is if rules are enforced. But if you can grab a chair and hit somebody or break somebody's eyes multiple times and not get disqualified, then there's nothing for the face to overcome. And there's no rules for the hill to break to get heat. Sure. So Terminus um, is a company that enforces rules um a lot of people look at rules handicapping them but in my mind rules help with creativity now you have to wrestle around these and figure sure. out how to make these rules make your match more exciting um and if we're giving you information that you have to understand people are more prone to like understand it filter through it and then are excited and, and welcome having to think with the high spot way of wrestling, you don't necessarily have to think, you just react to it. But my goal is to hopefully soon garner like genuine emotional reactions and not just reactions to wrestling. Right. That's my goal with Terminus. Get the fans and, emotionally involved, right? Yeah, yeah. And then hopefully bring back heels and faces. Uh, there's this tweener thing that people are really – a lot of tweeners now. right now, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's just it's not it's not a bad thing to be honest. But when everybody's doing it, then why? Let's be different, you know. Um, that's just my way of thinking. Hearing you break that down and uh, just watching Kurt's reaction as I get to sit here and do that, I can't help but think, man, we've talked about dream matches before. I would have loved to see a Jonathan Gresham Kurt Angle match. You know what I mean? My goodness, oh, I think God. you two could have put on an album. I would have match. thoroughly enjoyed that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's, that's for sure. Well, listen, we'd be remiss not to mention your amazingly talented wife, Jordan Grace. To me, she's a star and the sky is the limit for her. Talk about her for a minute and what are some of her goals in the wrestling business? Man, I think uh, she and I are in the same boat when it comes to things that, um, you know, we've accomplished. Uh, we were just having this conversation um, not too long ago, but we're both in this boat where we've exceeded the expectations that we had in our head for ourselves. 
for me, I, I couldn't see past becoming Ring of Honor World Champion. She, like myself, has come into contact. We are now friends with, co-workers with, uh, individuals that we used to watch on television. Um, and it's so surreal. So it's just like, what comes next for us? So uh, my wife has started dabbling in um, uh, professional uh uh, powerlifting so she's won several competitions so it, it's not so much in ring for her she's kind of finding a new love and passion um so for her that's what she's kind of going into now i think she has a competition coming up this is either april or may i believe the next one's coming up but the last two she's like one best lifter i, I could take you in our gym and she's got like plaques all on the wall so like um yeah she, she's i think the last one her total lift was like over a thousand pounds, wow. something like that. So yeah, she's doing, she's doing really good. We just went to the gym this morning and uh, we did a uh, uh, chest and it was really fun looking around the gym. Whenever she gets ready to lift, I just kind of <laughs> put my hands on my hips. So, yeah, my wife. <laughs> How much can she bench press, Jonathan? Um, Right now, she, today she was doing 225, but she repped it like, five times so it's just like i'm pretty sure you can do like i can't do that right? holy crap <laughs> yeah she's she's pretty she's pretty jacked right now man so i've had the opportunity to meet her a few times in person and my goodness she's the real deal bro i mean she she's intense yeah. and she's uh yeah. like i said she's got star written all over her so I'm, I'm glad to hear that and i'm it's cool to hear that she's doing some other stuff just not wrestling but getting involved in other things too so yeah yeah for sure for sure very proud of Jonathan, you. please plug whatever you need or want right now. Uh, you know, I, I really can't thank you enough for joining us. I'm going to get your address after the show, and I'm going to send you my chicken snacks. You got there you go. Awesome. I look forward to it. Thank you very much. But plug whatever um, you want right now, Jonathan. Okay. Um, well, I guess I'll plug my Twitter because I have to do that. Uh, my Twitter is uh, at the John Gresham. And uh, I guess – for the most part, me traveling to to Europe and Canada and stuff, and those guys are having a really difficult time with, um, you know, getting jobs because of their situation with the border. So I would encourage you guys to do uh, as much um, in-depth searching as you can uh, of wrestlers beyond the United States because there's so many guys that uh, that need your attention. They need your, your tweets, your, your, your blog posts about them because there's so many great wrestlers across the pond in Germany and England and different things of that nature. And they really need a spotlight that they're not able to get because they can't get to AEW and WWE and impact and things like uh, Americans like myself could. So I would just encourage you guys, your fans of your podcast, to please go out and look at WXW, watch progress, rev pro um, C4 in Canada, um, just take your time to look somewhere beyond the United States and Japan because there's so many great wrestlers out there, so many great wrestlers, and they need your help. So please uh, go watch them. Well, Jonathan, you're a really great guy for doing that. That's that's a great thing to plug. It's not about yourself. I, I respect that entirely. Thanks, Listen, sir. you you got two fans in Kurt Angle and, and Paul Bromwell yes, here, did. and we cannot wait to see what you're going to do. Who knows what's going to come of the new Ring of Honor under Tony Khan, but we're excited. We'll be watching it, and I know you're going to be a part of it, man. So nothing but best wishes from the Kurt Angle show. Good luck, and thank you for joining us today. Jonathan, I'm going to email you, and you're going to send me the, the your address. I'll, I'll, I'll email you. Email me back your address. Yes, sir. Thank you very All much. Right, thank you for having me, guys. Take care. Take care. Yep, Appreciate it. All right. Thank Thanks, you. You Jonathan. too. Wow. Kurt. Well, that was an excellent interview. So, so nice to meet Jonathan and, uh, really insightful answers. Good time, uh, talking with him today, buddy. Yeah. Well, I can't even talk today. I had surgery on my mouth. I, I was, was going to ask you what happened, Kurt. I, my whole face is swelled up. <laughs> I can't talk. <laughs> I thought, is he wearing the, the mouth guard or, did, or what, what's going on? It looks like I a chipmunk. Go, Cause my lips so swelled. I can't even ask questions. I was like flubbing and I can't, can you hear me right now? <laughs> I can, I can. I'm just laughing. I'm so sorry. If you, I know if all the ad free show members, okay, you can get this on video. You will be able to tell as I could that Kurt, something was up and I didn't know what happened. I was going to text you after this, but I love the fact that you're being transparent with the audience. I thought the swelling was go down by today but it didn't <laughs> it didn't you were smiling you look like the joker dude <laughs> i love it well hey thank you for being a trooper and sticking with the show and doing this man so 
I do it for the fans. That's right, my friend. Hey, he's always done it injured, so it doesn't matter. This is true Kurt (laughs) Angle, so there we go. Listen, next week right here on the Kurt Angle Show, we're going to be discussing your return to the company at WrestleMania 33, being named the general manager, and the build to your match at WrestleMania 34, teaming with Ronda Rousey to take on Triple H and Stephanie McMahon. So, Kurt, we're looking forward to that one. But, buddy, before we get out of here... I'll, you got to share a few more words with your chipmunk mouth. Tell us about chick, chicken snacks. <laughs> a chicken snacks. <laughs> oh, Here they hilarious. are. You can order them at physicallyfit.com. They're high protein, low carbohydrate. One's chicken protein over here. One's plant protein over here. You get to choose 11 different flavors. Go to physicallyfit.com to order yours. And if you use angle pod, you get 20% off your first order. And if you become a lifetime member, you can sign up on the website. You'll get 20% off the rest of your life. So there it is. Angle pod, 20% <laughs> off. I'm just kidding. I can't do that. This is good stuff. Angle pod for 20% off physically fit.com for all your snack needs. And Kurt's going to hook up Jonathan Gresham this week. So maybe next time he's laid off, if he's thinking about snacking, he'll have the right kind of snacks this time around. We got the Kurt angle brand.com too, Kurt. Do you want to tell them what they can find at the Kurt angle brand? Yes, we got cowboy hats, milk cartons, photographs. We have birthday cards, T-shirts, cameo video messages. Go to KurtAngleBrand.com and order whatever you want, and I'll send it to you. That's right. Even if you want a selfie of him right this particular minute with his nice new <laughs> smile, he can do that for you, too. If also- your cameo video message. <laughs> Go to wildcatbelts.com to find that Kurt Angle American Hero Championship belt. Uh, Twenty, It's great pictures on, on the website, Wildcat site. Kurt's holding it up now if you're watching on video. Beautiful belt. Listen, I know there's a lot of shilling that goes on on these shows. We're shilling some products, but it is the real deal when it comes to championship belts. And Kurt, are you playing with a puppet over there? What, what are you wrestling around with? Uh... This is what do you call this? Uh, this is uh, one of those wrestling uh, buddy, wrestling buddy, Kurt Angle wrestling buddy. Yeah, this is from. Uh, I believe you can get it at um, uh, on on our website. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, we can get boxofgimmicks.com. Boxofgimmicks.com. Yes. There's so much Kurt Look Angle wrestling stuff, buddy. Man. There. Yeah, they got a lot of Kurt Angle merchandise. I don't advertise that very much. But that's where you can find it, and you can throw that little wrestling buddy in an ankle lock as much as you want, and that's where to find that. Also, check us out, youtube.com forward slash The Angle Pod. Twitter and Instagram at The Angle Pod. Find him on Twitter at Real Kurt Angle, and on Instagram at The Real Kurt Angle. And, buddy, we have two more plugs. One, Wives of Wrestling. And if you don't listen to them, Giovanna is going to put you in an ankle lock. But they're having fun, aren't they, Kurt? Oh yeah. It's a fun show. That's all they do is have fun. And they talk about their lives and they tell stories. It's incredibly, um, it's incredibly exciting to, to listen to it. I actually listened to three of them. I sat in this room and listened to the podcasts while they were doing them, three of them. And I absolutely love them. They're entertaining as hell. Now, Kurt, I see you looking up. Is she standing there with the broom, like getting ready to hit you? (laughs) If you don't put these over. No, she's not, but. I think she's going to thank me for putting it over. There you go. It's, it's a great oh, show. It's entertaining as hell, dude. She, I've, I've seen some of it. It's, it's good stuff. They, they drink their liquor <laughs> and say their swear words. That's for sure. Yes, they have the swear jar. I, I think my wife keeps winning. She does swear words. Yeah. On the yeah. podcast. We need to send the angle kids earplugs. That's what I'm learning. <laughs> so, You're right. So here we go. Our final plug, and this is a brand new one, guys. Hopefully you've stuck around because we're about to talk about podcast at the plate. What the hell is podcast at the plate? Well, what I can tell you is if you're living in the Appleton, Wisconsin area, it's right outside of Green Bay, Saturday, August 27th, for the first time ever, Paul and Kurt Angle are coming to that baseball game, the Wisconsin Timber Rattlers, to do a live Q&A, a live requ- uh, Q&A there for, for those, a sign and meet and greet with Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle is going to throw out the first pitch at the game. It is going to be all about uh, a wrestling night there in Appleton, Wisconsin, Saturday, August 27th. Kurt, I know you're excited about that. Oh, I'm excited and finding out you're going to be there too. Made me even more excited. Oh. I, I am. This is a really cool thing to do. I, I think that, uh, 
we're going to continue to do this more and more in the future. And I'm pretty excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. There'll be, a, like I said, our uh, live Q&A. Uh, they're going to get to get their pictures with you, autographs with you. Again, you're throwing out the first pitch. Wrestling night at the baseball game. We're calling it Podcast at the Plate. And uh, that's Saturday, August 27th. So mark your calendars. Kurt, that's going to wrap us up this week. Get better, will you? Kind of get well. Rest <laughs> up. I promise by next week I won't be talking like this. <laughs> Uh, it's been good. That's been them. That's been entertaining as hell. So I'm glad you shared that. Uh, you knew but, something was wrong, huh, Paul? Oh, I could totally see it with the Joker smile the whole show. Why were you afraid to say anything? Yeah. Well, so- we're we're <laughs> we're interviewing Jonathan Gresham. I can't talk about it until after he's gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good stuff. Well, listen, we appreciate all of you joining us for the Kurt Angle Show, and we'll see you again right here next week on the Kurt Angle Show. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30 year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money, it's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.